All right, we are recording. Good morning and welcome to our fourth annual New Jersey Environmental Health Summit. This year's topic is maternal and child environmental health and justice. The program is part of our community engagement program at the Center for Environmental Exposure and Disease or SEED, C-E-E-D, which is, which is an environmental health core center which is funded by the National Institute for Environmental Health Sciences or the NIEHS. This is the fourth in a series of environmental health summit programs to bring together scientists from SEED and EOC, the Environmental and Occupational Health Sciences Institute, with community members, advocates, and policymakers around current issues in environmental health, focusing on issues in New Jersey and with a special focus on vulnerable populations within the state and environmental justice. Previous topics included New Jersey's ports and public health, drinking water and health, and COVID-19 as in an occupational and environmental health problem. Even before being born, a baby is exposed to many of the same chemicals and environmental factors that the mother is exposed to. Environmental chemicals and other stressors can affect not only the health of the mother and her pregnancy, but also the growth and development of the unborn child. Adverse effects starting during development in the uterus can have lifelong effects. And we were just learning about how exposures early in life can set the stage for chronic diseases that we've always thought of as being diseases of old age. Early childhood is a period of vulnerability to environmental stresses and a young child's immune system and other defenses are still developing. Also pound per pound, children may be exposed to more or higher levels of environmental contaminants than adults. Children are also vulnerable because they do not have the ability to protect themselves. Pregnancy is also a vulnerable time for the mother. And we were, we were learning more and more about adverse effects of chemicals, environmental chemicals on the mother as well as on the child. How the environment affects the health of mothers and children is a strong area of research at SEED and at EOC. We have several investigators doing cutting edge research in this area. We'll hear from a number of these researchers in this series of webinars. The series features the work of these scientists, but also community members and advocates, as well as policymakers. Today's session, Food Choices for Healthy Babies, focuses on some of the choices that mothers have to make about what to eat during pregnancy and what to feed their babies. Environmental contaminants, unfortunately, complicate these choices. Our expert panel will help to put the risks and benefits of these choices in perspective. In two weeks, the Mad Mothers session will explore the historical and current roles of mothers in the environmental health movement, strongly motivated to protect the health of all children. The next session on chemical exposures to consumer products will shed some light on what may be the largest source of chemical exposures for many mothers and children. The consumer products that we bring into our homes, such as cleaners, cosmetics, and personal care items. It is hard to know what is in these products, and there is incomplete but growing knowledge about how they may affect health, especially for women and children. Pesticides are another class of products that we bring into our homes, but to which we are also exposed at work or through residues in, in food as well as in water. Pesticides have of course, been a public health concern since the early days of the environmental movement and publication of Rachel Car Carson's Silent Spring. This session will focus on the effects of pesticides on developing children, both here in the United States as well as in other places around the world. The session on faith and maternal and child environmental health will attend to the spiritual aspects of motherhood, fatherhood, children and family, that are important in all faiths and which, and we will explore how faith and spirituality can help us to define values and motivate action to promote environmental health. The Healthy Home session will concentrate on lead paint and lead pipes, which have been a perennial problem since at least the time of the Roman Empire. But this session will focus on recent progress, new policies, and the work that still needs to be done. 
the air pollution session will in turn uh, take the latest findings about how air pollution may affect not only the health and, uh, and growth and health of children, including the development of their lungs, but also the many other far-reaching effects that air pollution can have on pregnancy and development of the unborn child. Finally, the uh, climate change and impacts on maternal health uh, session will tackle many of the ways that climate change affects maternal and child health today and into the future. This session will provide perspectives on climate change as a truly generational challenge, affecting not only our children, but our children's children, and perhaps all future generations. So with that, we have a very exciting series of sessions lined up, and uh, we hope that uh, you can attend these sessions and also spread the word to others who may be interested. So now I'd like to introduce uh, Kerry Butch, who's our Community Engagement Coordinator for the Center for Environmental Exposure and Disease. Uh, she'll be moderating uh, this session. Uh, Kerry. Hi, everybody. Welcome to our inaugural session of the Maternal and Child Environmental Health and Justice Series. We're really, really excited about this series, and I want to kick it off by just saying that we are welcoming questions. We've actually extended our session to be an hour and a half. So we're welcoming questions and I will be fielding questions with the panelists. Just put everything in the chat. So um, we're expecting the presentations to be about an hour. Um, every once in a while, Mike and Joanna are gonna, they're the co-facilitators, they're gonna be, um, coming to us and um, asking what's in the chat and I'll be able to tell them. So please, this is meant to be an interactive panel. So please go ahead and um, we're gonna be 100% um, want it to be interactive. Um, if you know anything about Mike and Joanna, they are, um, the inst they are an institution at EOC because they've been here for um, since the very beginning um, they've set the tone, essentially, of EOC, which is our institute, which is the Environmental Occupational Health Sciences Institute at Rutgers. I don't want to go um, majorly into it. I want you to enjoy and experience who they are. But Mike, just to tell you who they are a little bit, Mike's our professor at Meredith. Um, he taught at Robert, at Robert Wood Johnson Medical School. And he's active, he's still active at EOC, even though he's retired. And um, just a tremendous gift at, to us at EOC and to the New Jersey environmental health community. Joanna Berger is a distinguished professor. She's still with us full time. She works for the Department of Ecology, Evolution and Natural Resources at the School of Environmental and Biological Sciences at Rutgers, both to um amazing gifts to the Rutgers community so I'm not going to take up your time with them with with um I'm just going to let you experience them but again every once in a while they're going to ask me what's happening at the chat and the last half hour is really going to be donated um to participation from the audience so please um please definitely put your questions in in the chat and and you'll have we're looking forward to an interactive session. So thank you for attending. Okay, thank you very much, Rob and Kerry for the introduction. Uh, you need to stop sharing your screen, uh, whoever is sharing it, I guess Rob. And then we need to share. And with a little luck, people will be seeing maternal nutrition on their screen. Let me know if that's not uh, happening. I should say from the beginning, slide. Okay, I'm going to assume that you're seeing maternal nutrition, the benefits and risks of eating fish. Not yet. Not yet. So then I'm, I need to do something different. What do I need to do, Maria? It says share. Did that make a difference? Share and then select your slides. 
let me go back to this and yeah, try a different one. Could you press that share screen there? Did that make a difference? Not yet, Mike. Mm. Where did you have it? Bob, you've definitely stopped sharing your screen. No, he's he stopped. You have to press share. Let's screen. try over here. Share screen. And then do you see it now? Not now. Hmm. That's no different. No. Go back to the hmm. interesting. It's because we had it working before. Micah, could you try maybe you see, email your Maria, are, are, are you Maria. able to share this Mike's Mike some I'm not able to do that on my end. No, she needs to promote that from his computer. There should be a button that says share screen with an arrow. Get out of it again. Do you want to send them to Rob? It looks like his he can share his screen right now. So you have to press that share. Yes, and then you click on the button that says share share screen. Share screen then press that. Okay, we got it. We got something. Yes, thank you. You don't have it. You're in. Okay. You have to do from the beginning. I show and then from the beginning. Great. Okay, now you're seeing it? Yes. Oh, that's really good. Okay, so <clears throat> throughout this presentation, we keep in mind the environmental justice uh, components of this. Uh, the environmental exposures, the toxicologic exposures, and also the nutritional benefits do not occur in a vacuum. They occur in a complex context shaped by both the genetics of the family, the socioeconomic environment of the family, uh, the community and support systems of the family, as well as access to prenatal care and health care. Any or all of these can cause stress, which in turn influences the body's susceptibility or tolerance, and in turn the healthy development of a baby. We talk about cumulative environmental assessment as a way of pulling together all of the these uh, issues. And you can see here, the baby is really at the center of interaction between this variety of factors. Oops. Sorry. Okay. And each one of these components has different uh, subcomponents, uh, which we'll uh, take up in turn. A large part of prenatal and well baby care concerns diet, both for the mother and the baby. Now, <clears throat> Dr. Lombach was pointing that out in the introduction. Healthy diets provide micronutrients and macronutrients, and conversely, poor diets deficient in calories, protein, minerals, folates, uh, are associated with uh, delayed uh, growth, a baby that's small for its gestational age, uh, and in turn, other health problems, both in infancy and uh, in adulthood. The last trimester of pregnancy is mainly for growing the full-term baby and avoiding a low birth weight for gestational age. Maternal nutrition during pregnancy impacts placental and fetal growth, and undernutrition is prevalent in many developing countries but also in developing neighborhoods, and it has many consequences. Uh, it's uh, disheartening to read how much food insecurity there is right here in New Jersey. Overnutrition linked to obesity and metabolic syndrome can lead in terms to adverse outcomes in infancy, childhood, and even adulthood. Metabolic syndrome, for example, obesity, hypertension, diabetes is both a heritable, but also an acquired uh, abnormality. And both epidemiologic studies and animal studies highlight that undernutrition, overnutrition, and poor diet composition 
negatively impact the fetal and placental development, the metabolic patterns uh, at which have adverse effects uh, later in life. Neither genetics alone nor adult lifestyle alone uh, are responsible for our adult phenotypes, but something called fetal programming is believed to play a role. Uh, David Barker is credited with the origin of the concept of the fetal origin of adult disease, the Barker hypothesis, uh, that undernutrition during gestation impedes intrauterine growth. Baby is small for gestational age. And this leads to many health issues in infancy and childhood, problems that don't stop there. One of the sources of this information, uh, one of the ways in which people began to appreciate this happened back in the 1940s at the end of World War II when Germans blockaded the Netherlands for months leading to a famine of great proportion. 20 years later, when the babies who were born during this famine period were examined at military induction, outcomes uh, health outcomes were recognized that were attributable to uh, basically to starvation. The starvation during the last trimester contrib contributed to thin, underweight children uh, and failure to uh, develop adipose tissue cellularity is one of the hypotheses of that. Whereas undernutrition in the first half of pregnancy resulted in other childhood adulthood abnormalities and a variety of physiological uh, theories have been advanced as to explain this, but you can visualize if this is a period of famine for about six months, some babies are conceived before the famine and then experience the famine in the latter half of their just uh, development. And other babies are conceived during the famine, but escape the famine uh, when food is restored later in their development. So I wanna turn attention to an environmental toxicant. Uh, mercury, all forms of mercury are toxic to all forms of life as far as we know. And these toxic properties account for much of its usefulness as antiseptics, as fungicides and so forth. It's also useful in amalgamation. Uh, this uh, accounts for its ability to dissolve gold and silver and it's used widely in mining gold around the world. The, the big commercial gold mines don't use mercury. It's really small uh, mom and pop mines that mix mercury with gravel to, and use it to extract gold. Elemental mercury is known as quicksilver. That's the silvery liquid that some of the older people in the audience may remember playing with, but of course has become uh, forbidden, and on the other end, the methylmercury, organic mercury, um, this can be bound to organic material. It can exist in the gaseous phase. It can be transferred in the atmosphere, theoretically all around the world. And methylmercury is a highly toxic form uh, that is found in fish. I'll just mention that some forms of mercury are also uh, toxic enough to kill with just a few drops. In Japan in the 1950s, uh, there was a community at Minamata Bay on the southern island of Japan uh, that was uh, contaminated by methylmercury from a chemical plant. And the fish there had very high levels of mercury. The fishing community ate a lot of fish and they experienced a strange disease um, that caused uh, chain, uh, abnormalities in adults, but particularly congenital abnormalities in children who were born essentially blind and helpless. And methylmercury became a poster child for environmental toxicology and neurodevelopmental effects. Mercury is not the only thing that you can get out of fish. PCBs uh, are present, but that's another whole story. About 25 years ago, we did a survey of pregnant women in New Jersey. We found that about 5% of them had elevated mercury in their blood. 
and about 10%, 13% had elevated mercury in their hair. So mercury has a global cycle. It's emitted from the ground to the atmosphere in volcanic activity, uh, forest fires, and by a variety of human activities, including the recycling of mercury. Mercury also escapes from the surface of the ocean up into the atmosphere. And then sooner or later, the mercury in the atmosphere falls back down to earth uh, where it can enter uh, both water, the fresh water and the ocean. So it's a global mercury cycle, it's ongoing, and it has some natural contribution and some artificial. And when we put this together, I was surprised to note that today, the main source of mercury worldwide is the gold mining, the small scale mining where people are using a lot of mercury and then they are burning off the mercury up into the air. Um, and there's an iconic photo of a woman hold, holding a nursing baby in one hand and shaking a little frying pan of mercury and gold in the other. Around the world, you can see that gold mining is the main source of mercury, but not in the developed countries of North America or Europe. Here, we attribute our mercury sources to coal burning power plants <clears throat> primarily. And this leads to the fallout of mercury from the Midwestern power plants up into the Northeast. Uh, so the mercury in the atmosphere gets washed out in rain, it falls into uh, ponds where it gets methylated and that methyl mercury becomes highly soluble and highly mobile in the food chain. New Jersey had a mercury task force and this is a cover of the report which shows that even uh, minute amounts, parts per trillion amounts in uh, bacteria and plankton can be amplified at every step of the food chain until by the time it gets into fish, it's up in the part per million range, enough to cause toxicity in people who eat it. I'm gonna skip that one. So why are we concerned? Because fish are part of a healthy eating pattern. They're high in protein, high in omega-3 fatty acids. For example, DHA, which is essential for nervous system development, rich in vitamins, rich in minerals, and fish are a good part of a diet for a pregnant woman. In fact, I was looking this morning at recommended diets and almost every one of them mentioned salmon as an important part of a pregnancy diet. The Food and Drug Administration recommends that pregnant women eat at least eight ounces and as much as 12 ounces uh, of seafood in a week. They do mention low in mercury. Um, and the fish is not only healthy for the baby, uh, but it's part of a Mediterranean diet for adults. Fish are the primary source of PUFAs uh, in, our, in our diet. And on average, pregnant women do not consume enough DHA. Uh, this can be made up for in, with supplements, but supplements are not used as effectively by the body as naturally occurring, um, as naturally occurring fatty acids. What we know about mercury and development comes mainly from two big studies in the Faroe Islands and the Seychelles. Uh, the Faroe Islands, they were eating cold water fish. It's a Danish European culture, poor, very poor in fruits and vegetables. And it found that uh, babies that were born with high mercury uh, levels were likely to have cognitive impairment. And based on that, the EPA set a reference dose that you shouldn't exceed 0.1 micrograms of mercury per kilogram of body weight. Seychelles, very different country, a very different uh, heritage, a diet rich in fruits and vegetables. They did not report a cognitive uh, deficit. And the um, CDC used this negative study as its basis for uh, an allowable intake of 0.3 micrograms. Actually pretty close to the EPA. Uh, I'm going to uh, skip over this one. So ideally, we hope that the benefits of eating fish 
the benefits of the DHA are realized at a level before the harms of mercury kick in. We don't actually have good data to support uh, that, but there is reason to believe that there is at least some displacement before you see uh, the harms of mercury. Most of the studies that did not find an effect didn't really have high levels of mercury. And if the mercury level isn't very high, you don't see an association and you do see the benefits of eating fish up to three times a week. However, if the mercury level is high, it does counteract the fish benefits. Um, well, ideally it would be good to have more birth cohorts followed forward with better exposure assessment, better biomonitoring of mercury and more knowledge about the beneficial and harmful constituents. But actually I think even more study is basically only going to fine tune what we know. Uh, there isn't a free lunch uh, and the best lunch is going to be salmon because it's low in mercury and high in omega-3s. And I'll skip over that. So the sensitive population is the fetus and the developing brain. Uh, infants also have developing brains which continue really up until adolescence. And so uh, having a diet that's high in DHA and low in mercury is a good thing. And with that, I'm gonna turn this over to Joanna Berger to talk about the fish side of the story. Good morning. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this issue as it relates to New Jersey and to fish in New Jersey and to women in New Jersey. As Mike mentioned, most women do not consume enough DHA and most fish do not have a lot of mercury, but those are general messages and one needs to think about specifics. And one of the things that we need to think about is that there are a lot of variations in all kinds of aspects having to do with the consumption of fish. The types of fish, the species and the size make a difference. The way you cook the fish, eating fish versus other meats. If you eat fish, you're obviously not eating meat or red meat. And so all of these choices are going to make a difference in what the risk is. This is one of my favorite pictures of a young girl who fishes a lot in the Raritan River uh, with her dad. And that's something that we're going to go back to that we need to remember that fishing is a, an important part of many cultures and many families activities. And that has to be taken into account as well. So as Mike mentioned, fish consumption is the main route of exposure for mercury for most people. Eating fish is very beneficial for health for a number of reasons that Mike discuss, but eating mercury in fish is obviously not beneficial. The mercury bioaccumulates in fish, particularly in older fish and larger fish, which is what we call food chain biomagnification. In general, about 90% of uh, the mercury in fish is methylmercury. And that's important to remember because people sometimes talk about mercury in general and don't think about the methylmercury, which is the dangerous part. And the other issue with fish consumption is the controversy about the protective role of selenium, which many of you have heard about selenium as a supplement that many people take. So I always like to kind of put this in a general perspective that the issue with fish consumption is not just how much many contaminants or what the rate of contaminants is in fish. It's also a lot of consumption factors having to do with how many meals people eat a week, how big their meals are, how they cook it, what species they eat and the fish they consume. But I also think that we need to think about all the issues that have to do with who is consuming with fish. What's the, what are the ethnicity issues? What are the gender issues? And pregnancy is, is clearly one of them. What about age? Gender is issue for eating fish is not as much of a factor for somebody who's 80 compared to somebody who's 30. Pregnancy status is obviously another issue, but it's not pre only pregnancy status, but how much fish you've eaten for a year or two before that, because mercury doesn't disappear. So there are a lot of different factors and we need to think about all these and all of them are important in, in looking at it. So let's look at some of these factors. Um, in New Jersey fish, and this is a, a range of fish, which are both 
uh, caught by fishermen, as you can see the two people in the top, um, and they're caught and commercial commercial boats that people go out on for recreation as well as for sale and they're the fish that are available in the supermarket and what you can see is that it's a wide range of mercury the vertical line is the mean that's the fish if you ate fish all year long what you might expect to get and the box is the standard uh, error but the line shows you what the range of values are so even in something like fluke the values can go up to 500 parts per million. And if you look at some of the other things like shark and tuna, the values can go up to as much as two parts per uh, billion. Just to kind of a quick look at how some of these compare for fish that you might and pregnant women might eat, the mean mercury uh, is shown. And you can see that salmon is very low. And the next thing I want you to notice about this is that all tuna is not created equal. I don't know about many of you, but I was brought up eating tuna fish sandwiches a lot. My mother always used to say um, tuna is brain food and we needed to eat tuna fish sandwiches. And because she always believed in buying the best, she bought the albacore tuna which is the albacore solid white tuna. And as you can see, there's about three times as much mercury in the albacore tuna as the uh, light tuna. So this is a case where information would make a huge amount of difference. And as you can well imagine, the tuna industry is not high on making this widely known. But if this is one of the really key lessons for people who are thinking about becoming pregnant and for pregnant women, if you have to eat tuna, do not eat the albacore tuna. It's three times as much mercury and is really at a level that you shouldn't be eating if you're pregnant. Um, the next one shows us striped bass that Mike and I are holding at an event we went to, then swordfish is even higher, but you can see that mako shark is way, way high. Uh, mercury levels also vary surprisingly, and most people are not aware of that they not only vary by the size of the fish, you can see the mercury level in bluefish, which is a fish that a lot of fishermen uh, catch both in the bays and along the, the Jersey shore. It's an, an easy fish to catch in there in for most of the summer, but you can see that the, uh, the you shouldn't eat the biggest fish. I mean, I know fishermen like to bring home the biggest fish, but what they ought to be doing is bringing home the fish that's right near the level that's catchable, that is legally catchable. There are seasonal differences as well. This is shows you the seasonal differences in bluefish and striped bass. The levels of mercury in fish you catch in the summer are lower than those you catch in the spring and the fall. Again, this is information that if it were provided to the public easily and in a form they would uh, easily get, uh, you could have a big difference in mercury exposure, particularly for pregnant women. Well, does it matter how much mercury is in it? There are three ways that people often think about the human health risk for mercury. One is to just say, what percent of the fish that are caught have are above certain guideline levels, which is often 0.3 parts per million or 0.5 parts per million. 0.3 parts per million, by the way, is the ambient freshwater criteria for those of you who are interested in freshwater and protection of our waters. So that's one way that people think about it. Another way is the hazard quotient. What's the average daily consumption over the reference dose? And that, of course, varies in different species and different amounts. And the third way is that some people are focusing on selenium and saying that selenium protects you against mercury. And if there's an overabundance of selenium, then I don't need to worry about the mercury. That is not true. And we'll talk about why that is not true in a minute. So risk assessment for mythomercury and commercial or self-caught fish is a matter of looking at the mercury intake, the average body weight, and the average meal size. And I'm not gonna quiz you about this, um, but one way of looking at it is the guideline way that I talked about to begin with. Um, the one person is catching, has a, a shark there and I'm holding a very big flounder. And again, so look at, this is the levels of mercury that I showed you before in fish in New Jersey that people can buy in supermarkets or can fish 
uh, themselves along the coast or in bays or estuary or in the Passaic River, other places. The three parts per million, I've shaded that out. Uh, people, the, this is, it, the 300 parts per billion is the same as 0.3 parts per million. So what I've shown you is the level that people, um, particularly pregnant women, shouldn't be eating. And you can see that for some fish, the mean is above that. And for other fish, you can get a fish or two that might be above that. So if you are pregnant, you really need to only eat the low mercury fish because in many fish, although the mean may be low, there may be high fish and you may get them in particularly if you're eating them in the spring and fall with self-caught fish. And remember remember that, that um, self-caught fish like um, bluefish and, and striped bass, people might worry about in spring and fall, but those same fish are caught commercially and are in your supermarkets. So even though you're, you're eating in the supermarket, it's not the same thing. So another one that people sometimes use is relying on selenium levels, which we actually an analyze in our lab at Eoshi and Mercury as well. Selenium has, the thing about selenium is to remember that selenium is an essential trace element. And so there's a very narrow range that is healthy for people. And so many fish are rich in selenium. And you need to also consider the fact that selenium varies seasonally. So if you look at these two, which you've seen before, the mercury rising in selenium with length or with size, this fish I could hardly carry. That was really a big fish. I only could hold it for a little bit of time. But if you look at the, the selenium levels at the bottom, selenium stays about the same regardless of fish size. And so if you are touting that selenium levels can capture the mercury, and so you don't need to worry about mercury toxicity, this is not going to work the bigger the fish you eat, particularly for these two, and you're going to get above a toxic level of mercury while not having enough selenium. And so there's seasonal variation, uh, and we talked about this before, so that the mercury is low in the summer, but selenium may be high. So basically, although selenium may reduce the toxicity of mercury, it's not clear how much it reduces it, and it's not clear whether it binds to the mercury in all like in the brain, how much does it really bind in the brain versus in other tissues? So we recommend against considering selenium with respect to using this. So we need to use site-specific data for the other ways. And this is a striped bass somebody caught along the shore. Some of the things that you really need to know in order to put this story together is how many days you spend fishing a year, because that's very important. And you might notice that the blue at the top were all surveys taken on the shore of fishermen who were actually catching fish. And you might notice that some people in some situations are fishing an average of 40 or 50 days a year. That's a lot of days. If you look at the meals per month, however, um, those are less because this turns out that people, A, don't always catch fish and B, some people don't like fish. So that it's important to know the number of meals per month, and you really need to know it from on-site, site-specific information, not the national averages, because it varies largely depending upon the ethnicity, the income level, and a lot of other environmental justice issues that people often don't think about. This is serving size, which is the second thing you need to know. You don't only need to know how many days they eat fish, but how many uh, fish they eat at a time. And if you look at Newark Bay and New Jersey Shore, uh, I'm showing you a lot of variation. This is because we did a site-specific study in those two areas to ask how much people ate, but we also asked what their serving size was for different species of fish. And we were amazed to find out that there's a great deal of variation in how much people eat of different fish, and this needs to be taken in to consideration when you're thinking about it. So how does it matter? Here we show the same fish we've showed you all along. And Mike talked about the health reference dose being 0.1. And this shows you how many fish, if you're eating it all year long, are above that level. In other words, they're in the unhealthy range. And it also shows you if you have the highest monthly intake, 
for women in, and men in New Jersey, both along the shore, but this was for the Passaic. You can see that a number of fish are above what people should be eating, people in general, not only pregnant women. So we did a study in Newark Bay that some of you know about, and what we found is that a lot of people are going fishing for crabs, for fish, and for both. And the amount of fish and crabs that people eat varies ethnically, which is very important to remember that the consumption for some of these is higher for African Americans, Hispanics, and Asians than it is for white people. And this, you can look at it this way, the percent of fishermen who consume their fish um, was highest uh, blue crabs for Hispanics and uh, striped bass for blacks. And if you remember, striped bass is one of the species that the mercury increases drastically by size. And people were uh, generally aware of the warnings but they thought the fish were safe to eat anyway. So we have a real problem with, with making the information clear. We really believe that fish are a great source of protein and people should eat them every week, um, but you need to know what species to eat and what species not to eat. Um, and again, so people were not aware of which species they should or shouldn't eat. But this is another important aspect that I think we really need to consider when we're talking about protecting pregnant women and children is that people go fishing or use these habitats. This is with Newark Bay and the Passaic. And as you can see, when you ask people, why did you come here? And why did you come to this particular place? The primary reason they say is for relaxation and recreation and to be outdoors, not for food, even though we interviewed people who were fishing, not people in general. And so they were actually fishing, but they still said the main reason they came was for recreation. And so if you look at it this way, you can see that selling or trading fish wasn't important and giving them away even wasn't important. It was relaxation and to be outdoors, getting away from the demands. This, these data were taken before COVID and I think this would even be more true now than it was then. And it gets back to if we're gonna manage uh, for reducing the risk to pregnant women, we have to think of all these things, attitudes and behavior, as well as the exposure. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the next phase of this, because I think it's really all well and good for scientists and community members to figure out who's eating what and what their risk and exposure is, but we really need to do something about it. And so we developed a risk communication brochure with Carrie Kirkflu and others at, at DEP. And we were working with the WIC uh, community centers. And our, our idea was to develop a communication tool and a learning plan and a lesson plan that be, could be given in the WIC centers to women about fish. And so we developed these messages. We had uh, two Hispanic women on our team and um, some people with other expertise. We had a social scientist economist myself. Um, and we were trying to develop a brochure that could be put in the WIC centers. And we started with doing something that was really glossy and, and uh, slick. And we ended up working with them and developing messages that they themselves like. And this, as I say, was largely a Hispanic community. And they liked the biomagnification emphasized by having red dots that, I mean, that are, uh, are harmful and are moving up from plants to small fish. There's three sizes of fish here to the larger fish and then end up on somebody's plate. And then they designed and one of them actually drew the pictures of the fish on a plate going into the mother's mouth down into our digestive tract and to the baby. And so um, we, we uh, developed this, sh this um, communication tool, both in English and in Spanish, uh, so that it would be easily uh, reachable for everyone in this WIC, these WIC community centers that we were, health centers that we were going in, and it was more complex, and so I'm not gonna quiz you on this, but the, basically the message showed them what they could and couldn't eat with diagrams that they liked. Now this, when, when, it, um, when the state saw this, our brochure, they said, 
<clears throat> you know, you, you don't have a lot of money. And so this is what you did, but we'd like to do one that's really slick. We can do it in 12 colors and we can make it really nice. And when we went back to our community groups and the, and the WIC centers, the women said, we have 80 uh, such brochures in our WIC centers. We want something that stands out and that we can relate to and that catches our attention. And seeing the little red dots go from the fish into my baby uh, is a better message for me than all the slickness. And so we didn't change it, but um, we had to kind of fight with the state about it. So um, we asked a lot of women what advice they would give a friend. And they said things like, don't eat fish from the port. And others said, fish is a good source of protein, but you have to be careful. And others said, I know when a fish is bad. And so what our data showed and what the women first said before they went through the, uh, the course at the WIC Center that they could, which was like an hour. I mean, it was just if the women are waiting to uh, go in and see the doctor, uh, then they could sit in on one of these before they went. And so uh, there's, it was very clear that there's a lot of room for making it clear to people what's going on. And the advice that Mike and I give all audiences um, if you sell the meat fish, it, you might experience health benefits by eating more fish. But if you eat more fish, you need to be very careful that you're eating low income fish. So our overall message is, fish is a really good source of proteins and you should eat it once or twice a week if you can. If you are a female be in an age that could become pregnant, you should, and are planning on becoming pregnant, you should always watch what you're eating in terms of the mercury levels in fish because it accumulates. You don't get rid of it. It's not like you can eat swordfish and tuna shark uh, steaks all the time and then decide, well, I'm going to get pregnant now, so I'll stop for six months. It's uh, You really need to be careful what you're eating all the time. You can go to the FDA uh, website to see the mercury levels in commercial fish. The problem with that is what I showed you in the data that we've seen so far, that they give you the mean level and they don't tell you how it varies seasonally, how it varies by fish size, by location. The fish in, in along Southern New Jersey coast was higher in mercury than it was even up near Sandy Hook. So there were a lot of differences that had to do with location, size, fish species, season that need to be taken into consideration. Thank you very much. I'll stop here. Okay, so I'm going to, uh, first of all, I'm going to stop sharing. And then I'm going to introduce Dr. Fan. So uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to Welcome Tina Fan, a longtime colleague. She's the director of the Environmental and Chemical Laboratory Services at the New Jersey Department of Health. And she supervises and manages many state and federally funded programs. Uh, this includes biomonitoring um, and chemical threats. I hadn't realized that that was a big part of what they were doing at DOH. DOH. Um, and I'm, I think in the interest of time, I'm not going to give a long list, but she's involved in many different kinds of programs and the, uh, including, I guess, fairly recently, the state has a medical marijuana testing program. So, um, Tina, why don't you take it uh, from, from there? Thank you for joining us. Uh, can you see my screen? Uh, it's yeah. not big though. Yes. It, you mean it's not big? In presenter mode, Tina, you need to switch the display settings to dual mode. The, at the top, keep going up. Yeah, I try to see. Keep going up. When it says display settings at the top. On the top? What yeah, is there, there, display settings. Move up a little bit. Yeah, keep going up. Display settings, you see it? Sorry, give me one second. Um. No, go up uh, at the top of the screen. There's three uh, menus. One says show taskbar. The other one says display settings. That one. I saw the show taskbar. Okay, move to the right. Display settings. Uh, on the right it says it's a mute. Stop mute participants. Sorry. About okay, you're, you're not seeing it. Um, I, I can see it. it. Okay, let me let me see how I can do it. Let me let me change it slightly. See whether this is going to. 
control. Here there's the slide control. Is that will be a slide control? No. No. You need to you need to move to the to the left when it says display sense. Maybe your your screen is your toolbar for the Zoom meeting is covering it. Yeah, I have like I know it's uh are you using two monitors? There you go. I'm using two monitors. How about now? There you I go. Have, Good. I have one of the monitors. Maybe. Okay, is this better? Yes. This is better, yeah. Okay, I will, because I want to do slideshow, somehow it's moved to another monitor. So I'll just stay at this one. Um, well, so hope this will be uh, clear, but in the meantime, I, I can explain my slide. Well, thank you, Michael, for the introduction. And also, you know, thank you and um, uh, for the invite uh, for me to present uh, New Jersey Bio Mining Program at this summit. Uh, today, I'm going to uh, focus on more on the mercury exposure because this is our main topic. Our colleagues may, uh, you know, share other uh, uh, exposure projects we conduct for other uh, environmental contaminants. Uh, New Jersey Biomonitoring Mountain Program is a, a joint supported by the CDC State Biomonitoring Cooperative Agreement, as well as the New Jersey State Government. Um, the, there are several goals of the biomarketing program. One of the main goals is to increase the state laboratory capability and the capacity to conduct biomonitoring. So with the development of the capability and capacity, we will conduct a population-based biomonitoring as well as a targeted investigational study to assess environment exposure um, that are specific to New Jersey communities. Uh, through these uh, you know, pro projects, we would like to foster collaboration and communication with our biomarketing stakeholders. As you may see a couple of uh, logos down the bottom of this slide. I, these are including one of the major uh, collaborators we have to work with in the past seven, about seven years. And also there's a table list of the target analytes that are included in our biomarketing program. So you may see besides metals, we also work on emerging contaminants, PFAS and other organic uh, contaminants. Um, we also established an advisory committee, uh, which include the experts from state uh, academic, as well as uh, community leaders. So they will provide guidance and directions to the program. Uh, this slide summarizes the accomplishment uh, from our uh, first grant cycle, which is from 2014 to 2019. Uh, during the first cycle, we have uh, conducted three main projects. One of the projects is a post-borough community exposure to PFNA. As many of uh, your uh, uh, colleagues are very familiar with, so this is a joint conducted by our laboratory as well as investigator from Yoshi that led by Dr. Wazil and Dr. Joe Jobless. And also we conducted a study to assess of New Jersey residents' uh, environment exposure using the convenience samples that are collected from blood banks and the clinical laboratory. And um, we, uh, another program we have launched during the first cycle is a prenatal screening program with a joint effort from University Hospital. I'm going to talk a little bit more after this slide. And um, besides the project that primarily funded by the CDC grant, we also established collaboration with uh, uh, other universities uh, such as John Hopkins, as well as uh, Rutgers, uh, as like Judy Scraper, Dr. Judy Scraper. We worked together on the firefighter exposure, uh, including PFAS and uh, for John Hopkins, we uh, worked together on the Boston cohort uh, study to look at the uh, maternal exposure to toxic metal as well as the health effects. So here just to show a list, a couple of the, um, the publications we have uh, published in, in the past couple of years. Uh, during our study, uh, during the first you know, cycle, we certainly identified the gaps. Uh, for example, for the um, study we conducted using the uh, remnant sample from collected from blood bank and the clinical lab, uh, we understand that's not truly population-based study, which may not be, you know, um, representative for New Jersey general population. So in our current study cycle, which started in 2019, we uh, 
launched the New Jersey Health Nutritional Examination Survey, which is uh, mirroring CDC and hence uh, study many of you are familiar with. Uh, we are going to collect the blood, urine, specimen, as well as the questionnaire data from 500 participants uh, during probably two to three two to three year uh, the period. And we are going to uh, assess uh, chemical exposure for metals as well as other toxic organic compounds. As you see, there's a logo of our enhanced study. Some of the audience here, you may be randomly selected for our study. If you do, please participate. Um, additional study we have, uh, we're, going, we're working on is an exporter study. We would like to, um, see whether we can develop some screening tool uh, using the uh, remnant sample collected by the uh, newborn screening program, which is a dried blood spot. So we want to look at the uh, metal as well as other uh, persistent organic compounds. And then we're going to explore the association between the exposure that measured by, uh, you know, use, uh, by the use of the dry blood spot as well as the biomarkers that are collected by our, our newborn screening program and see whether there's any association. And the ultimate goal of course is trying to identify whether we can use this as a tool to identify the children uh, at a risk for autism. Um, another one, as you see is uh, in red, which is our main uh, focus today, is our parental metal exposure and intervention program. So during the second cycle, we are going to continue uh, to work on the um, prenatal screening program uh, to, ex you know, to expand the testing for, you know, continue test for all the patients that are registered at the university hospital. In the meantime, we are going to uh, conduct assessment of exposure and health effects for the patient with elevated toxic lead and mercury level. And uh, we are going to expand the uh, prenatal screening program to other high risk cities in New Jersey. Uh, the next few slides basically summarize our uh, prenatal screening program uh, we are working on. As you all have heard uh, from Dr. Gutchfield and Dr. Joanna Berger regarding the source of mercury exposure, as well as uh, many health effects associated with uh, prenatal exposure to mercury. And uh, many of them are, you know, you may has been associated with the risk even at the, you know, the level lower than the current health limit. And however, compared to, you know, lead exposure, there is much less of, uh, you know, screening for mercury um, during the, you know, parental care. So, which is one of the major in, uh, motivation we have uh, to conduct our program. So the procedure while we have uh, that has been established at the University Hospital is the following. So the uh, lead and the mercury screening is being added to the prenatal lab test for all new patients at their first visit. Uh, we also collect the blood from mom as well as the core blood at the delivery to screen uh, mercury and both mercury and the lead. Uh, if the core blood is not available, then the health stick will be done at 24 hours. Uh, you know that will be from the baby. Uh, the pregnant women are also provided education material due at their first visit, as well as they are given uh, some vitamins, which will be good for the pregnancy. And uh, we will collect the collected blood sample will be shipped to our laboratory for analysis, and we will report the results back to the uh, hospital, they will share the results with the patient. So for any level that are higher than five microgram per liter, we will uh, report right away the results is, you know, we will form, uh, you know, call them uh, before we like generate the formal report. Uh, if there are over 28 microgram per liter, we will inform our epidemiology group as well. So the doctor will review the results and then they may implement treatment based on the level of uh, the mercury and the partners such as New Jersey Poison Control, others will provide additional support to the family if needed. 
Next slide to summarize our progress uh, we have made so far. So as I mentioned, the program was launched in June, you know, in the first grant cycle uh, in June 2019. And there were, you know, continue work on the uh, project, uh, the program right now. And we have uh, completed more than 8,000 tests uh, since the uh, beginning of the program. We have found more than 600 elevated results, which is actually quite a surprise. Uh, you know, as many of you know, University Hospital is located in Newark. We more or less saw that we may, we may see more lead, uh, elevated lead, lead level. However, we actually found more mercury, not lead. And uh, thousands of patients been given education material and the, the one with elevated level has received the treatment. Here, I'd like to show you about two typical cases we have observed during our program. Uh, the first one is a 30 year um, mom and uh, came to the visit at about 10 weeks uh, gestation. And the lead level was below the health limit. However, the mercury was high as about, you know, close to 45 microgram per liter and all are mercury. Uh, mercury. And uh, the patient was uh, brought back to the hospital and, uh, you know, the doctor provided treat treatment and there's a follow-up test as well every month or two months. It depends on the level. Um, it's uh, finally, as you may see, uh, when the baby was born, uh, the mom's level was down to you know 3.4 microgram per liter, and the baby's about 7.37. Both are much lower than the level which was observed at the first visit. And the source we have identified is through the questionnaire. Uh, is likely as it's, you know, fish consumption. That's why we have uh, advised them to change the, uh, you know, fish consumption, just as you heard enough from uh, the information about the uh, fish as a source for the uh, mercury. And uh, apparently you can see it's uh, effective uh, after the change of behavior or, you know, change of the, uh, the diet. And another case I want to show you is about the newborn baby. Uh, the, the, the mom only went to the hospital during the delivery. So there's no data of the, you know, prenatal, like uh, the early visit prior to delivery. And what we found that the baby was 80.63 uh, microgram per liter and mom is about 32. So it's really high. And the patient also was treated immediately uh, by, the, uh, by the doctor. And you can see the level also gradually uh, going down. And uh, another thing I want to mention about this particular case is that uh, the, the blood sample actually the hospital did not send to us, they sent to the commercial laboratory, they, they did the test. So, um, but anyway, overall, you can see the two cases I've shown you here, both has a close to, they're pretty much 100% mercial mercury and the source of exposure is primary from the tuna fish consumption. Uh, next slide shows a summary of our, uh, the results we have obtained so far. As you may see, we have about more than 10% of the babies above the health limit, and about 50% of the uh, population are in the range with expected health effect or above the limit, which is uh, the uh, dark orange. And also we found only less than 10% of the baby with no detectable level of mercury. So, this is quite alarming, you know, when they, when we observe all those results, and we actually observe this similar patterns after we conducted about, uh, I think, about less than a year of this study. So we have shared the information with our senior management, uh, CDC, and other partners, and I will talk a little bit more about uh, what we will work on. Uh, we need to work on in the future. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, most of the mercury uh, we have found are uh, mercial mercury. So for, I uh, just want to uh, clarify one more time, for elevated level, we will conduct the speci uh, mercury speciation. And um, another thing I'd like to share is about the education uh, we have uh, implemented. So we kind of divided our, um, May, uh, our study as a, like a two phase. The phase one is the first uh, six months uh, 
when we uh, launched the program uh, up to the six months. Uh, so we apply the uh, we we are we give the education material to the patient whoever are registered at the uh, uh, at the uh, university hospital. So at that time, you know, many of the uh, pregnant women are in the sec second or third trimesters, and during the phase two, that we uh, pretty much is most of our you know new patient when they come in. So the education material were given to the uh, patient at their first prenatal visit. And uh, it, it's just interesting what we have found. As you will see the green bars, which represent the uh, non-detect, and they certainly will have, you know, show significant increase of non-detect uh, patient. And then the number of a patient above the detection limit was reduced, which is also, uh, you know, was also, you know, reduced. I would say not really exactly statistically significant. You know, the p value is 0.16, but certainly showed the trend about decrease in the uh, in the mercury uh, level. As uh, same thing, uh, we also saw a little decrease of the level of one to five, which is a range that has expected health uh, effect. So. Of course, this could be. Uh, this is also concurrent with the pandemic. We are right now not exactly clear whether any pandemic also maybe contribute to the uh, decrease or reduction of the uh, mercury level. But either way, um, we will think that the education material probably has uh, played a role uh, in reducing the exposure. Uh, additional work we've been working on right now with University Hospital is to uh, conduct retrospective chart review uh, for the patient with elevated level. Then we're going to look at the uh, exposure on the health outcome. And um, anyway, just a quick summary of our uh, you know study. Uh, from what we have done so far, we uh, clearly can uh, you know demonstrate that prenatal screening is a proactive, efficient, cost-effective means of reducing exposure. Uh, as you see, there are a couple of the cases with a very high level of you know mercury. Then they will be able to uh, address right after uh, you know the. Uh, what, right after we found the, uh, the results. And also the education material seems has uh, effect to reduce the personal exposure. And our, you know, with all presented by uh, Michael and Joanna, and as well as our results clearly shows it's very important to expand the center of care to other hospitals in New Jersey. Couple of questions I have here, which I do not have an answer, but hopefully through the joint effort in the future, we will be able to, uh, you know, address these questions here. So, you know, how we can do to address the health limit. Apparently, uh, the results show quite a significant number of patients has elevated level of mercury. However, there's no standardized protocol for the treatment, investigation, or follow up. And we also know these are very, very expensive <laughs> thing to do. It really require the resources to do all the treatment investigation as well as the follow up. So where we should have the funding source to do it, and um, you know how what we can do to increase awareness of professional training. As you will maybe surprise, not all the medical staff are so familiar with the source of exposure or how to address the uh, exposure uh, problems. As you know, Joanna also talking about the community, uh, the outreach, um, the people, how we can get the community to buy in. You know, how do they should change their behavior so they will be able to you know protect themselves from the mercury exposure of course is it really the long term how we will be able to expand uh, you know make the uh, the biomonitoring or prenatal screening for mercury and other environmental chemicals as a standard uh, as a long term program so i would like to just end here so like i said i have a lot of questions which you don't have an answer for and but these slides just to show you list the major uh, team members including you know erica bean uh, dr andrew stephen who are the lead the scientist of the prenatal project and also many supporters from uh, Rutgers and uh, many other uh, community members state uh, as a state uh, agency. 
Uh, thank you for your attention. I would like to stop here. Thank you, Tina. This is Kerry again. I have the pleasure of um, thank you, introducing. Tina, I have the pleasure of introducing um, Stacy Flanagan. So, Stacy, if you um, wanted to, first of all. Major heavy hitter um, <laughs> uh, runs one of the most, uh, I guess, one of the most, one of the biggest uh, health departments in the state of New Jersey. It's an award-winning health department um, of Jersey City. So I can tell you that I've been on the ground with Stacy in Jersey City, and she's doing a lot of work, and she's on the ground, which is what we really appreciate with our community engagement core. So um, I just want to tell you a little bit about her. Prior to her um, doing this fabulous work in Jersey City, she was the director of the Neighborhood WIC program at Public Health Solutions. So um, it, prior to that, and also in addition to that, she's a faculty member at the new school. Um, she teaches graduate um, in the graduate program for international affairs. Um, her work history includes Share Our Strengths Cooking Matters. Um, she also served as the Mandel Fellow at the Leader to Leader Institute, formerly the Peter F. Drucker Foundation for Nonprofit Management. Um, she was at Big Brothers and Big Sisters of New York, and she was a Peace Corps volunteer. So Stacy comes to the table with a, a whole lot of experience, and uh, I appreciate her, you know, Jersey City is where my family started out, or at least part of my family. So it's always wonderful to uh, to have a home girl come and, and talk to us um, at EOC. So right now I'm going to turn it over to Stacey, but thank you very much for coming, Stace. Oh, great. Well, thank you for inviting me. And um, so I feel like the conversation all leads to WIC, um, a lot of things that people have been talking about. And so on the call also, I do have our WIC coordinator for the city of Jersey City, Sandra Sarenbaum, um, and she uh, has been with us for a little over six years, uh, came in as a nutritionist and connecting the dots um, for all of these environmental issues that we've talked about, plus um, where the environment intersects with food resources. Um, it's just like a great conversation to have um, around, you know, what the WIC program can really do and how it is one of the first lines of defense for uh, reducing some of these environmental risks in families, particularly families at risk. Uh, and I think um, I'm gonna share with you just the, um, I don't know if anyone else is sharing their screen. I'm gonna uh, just give you like a little overview of the state WIC program uh, and for those that don't know WIC, um, WIC was created um, in the you know late uh, 60s, early 70s um, as a uh, way to partner with uh, public health. And it started in Baltimore as a pilot project specifically around issues of children being born um, with low iron. Uh, and so uh, bringing formula to families' homes who had uh, a pregnant uh, woman and uh, monitoring them to ensure that uh, their child was born um, without any additional, um, you know, hardships. Uh, this pilot uh, worked so well that some really amazing people in Congress pushed it forward and it is now what we consider a benefit, um, not an entitlement. So it doesn't work like food stamps or Medicaid or Medicare, but this is a program that's uh, block granted through a state and then select the state selects vendors Jersey City happens to be one of the vendors uh, to put on a program to not only provide uh, specific vouchers, which we would call checks um, for specific foods related to specific nutrients. And I feel like a lot of the conversation prior to now was, 
all of these issues um, and nutrients and lack of nutrients and increase of things that we shouldn't have in the body. And, and in addition to those checks slash vouchers, one-on-one uh, -on -one nutrition uh, education and support. So you heard about, you know, talking about eating more salmon. Well, uh, in the past, sardines were in the WIC food package. And now, um, you know, we've opened up the door for WIC as early as in 2000 six, uh, pushing uh, lots of research through the Institute of Medicine to really identify uh, improved understanding of nutrients to get the right nutrients into um, bodies so that babies will be born with greater, um, you know, immunized uh, tools inside. Uh, so that is, uh, you know, one of the largest things that we do here at the Department of Health and Human Services in Jersey City. And I really enjoyed listening to some of the partnership um, happening. So I'll just share with you um, a little bit about WIC and then a little bit about where we're going to increase nutrients um, and where nutrients also help. And one of the things that wasn't really kind of highlighted here today is some of the lead work that we do and some things that we're really excited to share with you um, that will be coming out in the next few weeks. Uh, so uh, somebody in an at-risk uh, environment um, or has 185% uh, of poverty, is pregnant, post immediately postpartum, um, or breastfeeding um, can come to the WIC office to get support for themselves and or um, their children up to the age of five. So on average, as you can see here, uh, each child gets about uh, $55 worth of food. Um, a parent it gets about $60 a month worth of food and a little bit more if you're breastfeeding. And by year, we kind of share some of the exciting things that we want for children um, to know. But in year one, we're working with parents who are breastfeeding. We really focus on breastfeeding as like the literal carrot to get people to WIC um, as tools that they can um, provide just in their own home. And we can provide parent, you know, moms with additional support. Uh, to make sure that they're getting the right nutrients while they're breastfeeding. In addition to that, we have breastfeeding peer counselors uh, in our offices that can do online, on the phone, or in-person support um, to moms that are having difficulties. And then we move into pretty standard um, going from formula stage to feeding stage and working with um, families through the feeding stage and also uh, identifying some issues around feeding. Um, some feeding issues or some um, can identify possible, um, you know, pervasive development disorders. In addition to that, some um, of these uh, eating disorders or eating issues or concerns around what kids are eating or how their palate accepts food can also identify a blood lead level issue. Um, and so that's something in WIC that we partner very closely with our uh, city clinic and our um, we do uh, child led poisoning prevention programmatic work. Uh, and so we support uh, lead testing uh, in addition to the standard WIC blood work that we do um, to see if kid has iron uh, issues or the mom or uh, taking, um, you know, other BMI metrics. And then moving across the spectrum, at around three years old is when we start seeing kids leave the WIC program uh, because they're not getting formula or not getting sort of all the things that they want and transitioning into possible Head Start programs or daycares or, um, you know, pre-K-3. Uh, and then that transitions to um, food in the home and so, or food at school. And so school food uh, programs are really important to us here at the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, I wanted to share just sort of generally, um, 
you know, we have a very robust division of food and nutrition. Um, and our division of food and nutrition uh, not only manages the WIC program, but where we see WIC connecting with other programs. Um, we see grandparents connecting with their kids. And so we make sure in our Meals on Wheels program that we're getting um, all families, you know, treated and supported. We serve prior to COVID about 800 to 1,000 households. Our numbers have tripled due to COVID. Um, and so we, you know, make sure we do deliveries, but we often hear that some of these grandparents are taking care of their kids and they don't have some of the resources at home. So we make sure that we make that connection. Uh, in addition to that, we run a summer meals program. So our summer meals program uh, connects the dots for parents. So if you have children under the age of five, you can still come, um, Maybe you stop by one of our farmers markets during the week and we're providing you with meals for breakfast or lunch. Uh, we've expanded some of our reach uh, through our connection with the farmers market nutrition checks, really driving people to the farmers markets. Literally, we're driving them to the markets. Uh, we have a fabulous VIA program. Um, we have uh, buses that our seniors um, her accessing, um, and we, um, you know, really would like uh, to get parents um, to our farmers market so they can get fresh, rich, organic, nutrient dense foods, and that's really at the core of WIC. Um, in addition to that, we serve seniors in that way, so we run a senior uh, program. Um, and just uh, the other day and yesterday, there was a fabulous article in Bloomberg. And I thought I'd share with you our little um, new program called Healthy Greens uh, JC. And if you um, would allow me, I'm gonna see if this, um, if you can hear this. Let me see. Stacey, sometimes you have to stop sharing to then share again something new. Oh. oh. So did that not go? Could you not see that? No, we didn't see that. Arr. All right, let me. So I stopped sharing to share again. Okay, let me see. Let me go back to that. And let me go back to here. And I. Share again. Oh wait, wrong, wrong share. You need to share with audio from computer. All right. Um, I need to share through. Can I share it again to see if it works? If not, I can probably show sure. you. And check the box that says at the bottom, there's a box that says share with audio computer or something like that. You can check that. So just share sound. Oh, yeah. there it is. Optimize. Yeah. All right. Um, let me go back to that. Very, all right, I'm gonna share again. Let's, let's.
There's green all around us. And Jersey City is about to get greener. I'm talking green, leafy veggies with Healthy Greens JC, our new vertical farming program. But hey, what is a vertical farm? Think plants on shelves. No soil, no fertilizer, indoors, without sun. Add a mist with seeds and nutrients, and in a couple weeks, greens that are ready to harvest. And you get to eat them. How does it work? You have your health monitored, and you come to workshops to learn about nutrition, just for a year. In return, you get super yummy greens every 7 to 14 days. Easy. Healthy Greens JC will be in 10 locations across the city to help you eat in a more nutritious way. Diseases related to diet go down, and you live a healthier life. We launch soon, so check back for updates. Uh, so that's a little bit of our um, Healthy Greens program we're kicking off next week. Uh, we just built out a uh, vertical garden in one of our local housing authority sites. Um, I can share the link in the chat. Uh, we're looking to connect that back to programs like WIC so that we can talk about uh, increased nutrients, uh, high in vitamin D, and uh, really utilizing this as one of the, uh, you know, experiential education programs that we would highlight. Uh, I, I know that we're kind of tight on time, Carrie, so I'm going to just post this and uh, you can let me know if you want me to keep talking, invite Sandra or... Um, I think what I'm going to do right now, Stacy, is I'm going to thank you for everything that you've shared with us. And I'm going to quickly introduce next week's session. I'm sorry, not November 10th session, not next week's session, the November 10th session. And then I'm going to have Mike and Joanna close it. Um, but the November 10th session is making change and moving mountains when mothers discover their children's health is at risk. And that session is going to have um, Melissa Miles, the executive director of the New Jersey Environmental Justice Alliance, Luella Kenny, a Love Canal resident and researcher and community organizer, Hope Gross, the co-founder of Bucksmont Coalition for Safe Water, and it's going to be Maida Galvez from Mount Sinai, as well as being co-moderated by myself and Luz Gould from Mount Sinai. So we, I'm going to now turn it over to Mike and Joanna to close the session. Yeah. Thank you, Carrie. And I really appreciate the participation. We did run later than planned. And uh, that's my fault for not uh, keeping closer watch on, on our time. But Stacy, if you could finish, if you, you'd like to add some things to your, I have a feeling you didn't have a, a conclusion that you I was just sharing how important everything uh, that was talked about earlier and connecting that to like the food system and what we're trying to do by changing the way we're eating um, so that we can combat some of those other uh, issues and particularly environment. If I'm sure that there's uh, other sessions where people will hear more about nutrition and its combat for lead in the blood and things like that, that we talk about in our WIC program. So I think your, I think your program really sort of tied it together and, and came together with some of the other talks. So they were all, all of the talks were much appreciated. And I think it's, it's great that a, a beautiful little video, and I think it also you know, brings WIC to life more than just initials that somebody else deals with. So uh, we re really appreciate your uh, taking the time to participate with us in this session. I, I wanted to thank uh, everyone for their participation, the panelists and everyone else, and especially, you know, Carrie for organizing the session and the other sessions, and Maria Crescenzio for uh, doing the communications and the Zoom and getting us organized also. So thanks everyone. And I think that's the end of the program. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye. See you on November 10th. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.
Hi, Kerry. Maria, how many people were on the session were, were listening? Oh, yeah, at one time there was like 30, uh, 37 at the Okay, moment. that's good for our first session. Yes. I'm, I'm happy with that. I'm happy with 37. Yes, it was good. It was good. And people are saying great, great presentations. Thank you. Yes, yes. there were no questions, but it, it extended a little bit then, you know. But again, I, it was very good information. Is there anybody else on the on, or is it just me and you? That's about there's about five at least. All right. So why don't we um we can talk later on the phone? Yeah, why don't we talk later and, and I'll talk to you? I'll come over too. Bye.